Ladies and gentlemen, we'll start today's program. Please enter the conference room and take a seat now. As a courtesy to other participants, we kindly ask that you switch your mobile phone to silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. As with yesterday, simultaneous interpretation is provided for the conference. Channel one is for Korean, and channel two is for English. If everyone would come in and take their seats, we would like to get started. I would like to ask the panelists for session four to proceed to the stage. As we did yesterday, we are going to do another survey for session four. Please check out the piece of paper in front of you. We should have received a text message now. Click the link or use the QR code on the paper to fill out the survey. Please submit your response by 11.30. We'll check out the results at the end of the session. And please keep in mind that the newly amended provision of enhanced damages is applicable. Good morning, everyone. I'm George Gwangnam Kim, a patent court of Korea, coming back from yesterday to lead you through second day's program. I hope everyone had a good night's sleep last night, and we have a very full schedule. To be honest with you, I didn't expect this many people would come. We actually had to change the lunch menu. It was originally buffet, but what do you know? You are going to have a bibimbap, but no need to feel bad because bibimbap is a signature menu of this hotel. And it is also one of the most popular Korean food for participants from abroad. I hope this will be a chance to enjoy the taste of Korea. Let me give you an overview of today's perhaps a little too much productive schedule. We have a session four from 10 to 12, and then we'll have a lunch. After lunch, please go to the main entrance, this building, by 10.30 p.m. to take a bus. It will be waiting there to take you to, to the patent court of Korea. The afternoon session will take place at the court. The multi-court session starts at 2.30 p.m. Both patent and trademark session will take one hour each. All schedule will be over by 4.30 p.m. Now, let's start session four. This session got the longest time in this year's conference. And the biggest panel. We have a panelist from seven country. Seven country? You could say Seven Kingdom, like in the Game of Thrones. Furthermore, among panelists, there is Stark, the king in the north. Let's see who wins the Game of Thrones today. Moderator session four is a presiding judge, Hyungdu Kim, Seoul of Seoul High Court. Please join me welcoming him. Good morning. Um, actually, I'm, I'm the big fan of the Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's dark, yeah. Um, um, did you sleep well? Um, actually, I didn't. Um, my, my cell phone uh, started buzzing today, uh, in this morning early, continuously. Um, I, re I suddenly realized that today is my birthday. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have so many friends. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, my name is Hyungdu Kim. I'm presiding judge at the Seoul High Court, and I'm a former patent court presiding judge uh, years ago. Um, before we start, uh, we uh, let me introduce our panelists uh, by the grace of God. 
We joined by excellent judges and experts from all of the world. Um, to my left, uh, Dr. Thierry Kalim. Uh, he is from Switzerland. Uh, he is the president of European Patent Lawyers Association. Uh, the next uh, honorable judge, Kisu Kim. <laughs> he is from Korea. Uh, he is a judge at Patent Court of Korea. Next, uh, honorable judge, uh, Takahumi Kokubu. He is from Japan. Uh, he is a judge of IP High Court of Japan. Next, uh, Honorable Judge uh, Hong Liu. He is from China. He is a senior judge of Guangzhou uh, IP Court in China. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Oliver Swan. He is from Germany. Uh, he is a judge of the District Court of Munich One. Next, Honorable Chief Judge Leonard Stark. Uh, he is from US. Uh, he is Chief Judge of United States District Court for the District of Delaware. Next, uh, Honorable Judge uh, Ho Jun Yam. He is from Korea. Uh, he is the presiding, presiding judge of Seoul Central District Court. Next, uh, Mr. James St. Ville. <laughs> he is from UK. Uh, he is a senior barrister in eight new, new square IP chambers. Um, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Before we start, I'd like to uh, specially ask the speakers to keep your time limit. Each one of you will have three minutes uh, for the presentation. We need to finish our session by 12. It is a key uh, to, my uh, to our success uh, for the smooth progress of our delicious lunch and afternoon sessions. And actually, uh, we should move to patent court after lunch here. Uh, and so we have a quite tight schedule today. So uh, we, we should keep the schedule. Um, before we start, uh, we, uh, we sent several questions uh, to the panels in advance and about um, and the, we got answers, and we put their all answers in the book distributed to you. Uh, so uh, please refer to uh, the books. Uh, and uh, then uh, we got the answers. Uh, we have made a PowerPoint file uh, to understand you easily. Uh, it will show the summary of our panel's answers. Uh, let's start uh, by talking about the main issue. Uh, it's a topic one. Please. It didn't work. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I will continue. <laughs> Our main, main, uh, main topic is the adjudication of enhanced damages, uh, awarding criteria and assessment. Uh, this, this question is directed to Leonard uh, from U.S. and Hong from China and Ho Jun uh, from Korea. Please be prepared. In Korea, the Patent Act and the Unfair Competition Prevention and Trade Secret Protection Act, quite a long name, were amended recently. Both law allow the courts to award enhanced damages up to three times to actual damages. Here's questions. Uh, 
In your country, uh, are the courts allowed to award enhanced damages against infringement on IP rights? If so, to what extent? In your country, are the courts allowed to award enhanced damages only when the patentee makes claims specifically? Or are the courts allowed to award enhanced damages ex officio without the patentee's specific demand as long as the case satisfies the requirements for enhanced damages? In your country, is there any statute or precedent that sets forth the positive or negative requirements for awarding enhanced damages in an IP uh, right infringement case? In addition, are the requirements inclusive or exhaustive? In your country, uh, are the courts allowed to decide not to award enhanced damages even in cases where all of the requirements are satisfied? If so, under what conditions? Um, Leonard, are you prepared? Uh, uh, how do you answer these questions? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for those questions. Uh, I feel like I should first say happy birthday to our uh, thank you. Thanks esteemed very much. moderator. Thank you. And also should say, uh, although you gave me a lot of homework to prepare for this, uh, I have not watched uh, Game of Thrones, and <laughs> I feel unprepared suddenly uh, for what's expected of me. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Judge Kim, for that. Um, so uh, in the United States, uh, we have a statute. It's Section 284 of our Patent Act that does authorize the awarding of enhanced damages based on a finding of willful and egregious patent infringement. We've had the statute for quite some time, but a Supreme Court decision, the HALO decision from 2016, uh, has really transformed uh, the way we handle uh, enhanced damages. Uh, there were two main uh, things that the HALO decision did. It lowered the burden of proof from a clear and convincing standard to a preponderance of the evidence standard, making it easier uh, for a patentee to prove willful infringement and therefore uh, enter the gateway that would allow the court to enhance uh, damages. Uh, and second, it eliminated a prior test that our federal circuit had established, which made essentially any objectively reasonable defense to patent infringement a sort of, uh, we would say, a get out of jail free card. It was a, uh, a, a almost surefire uh, defense against a finding of willful infringement and therefore a finding of enhanced damages if you could point to any objectively reasonable defense. Uh, the Supreme Court did not like that test. They eliminated it and replaced it with a really sort of a totality of the circumstances uh, uh, subjective intent test, which makes it easier now to overcome a summary judgment motion and therefore put uh, willful infringement as an issue for the jury to decide and evaluate the entirety of the evidence and assess whether they think the infringement was willful. The way it works is if you prove to a jury that the infringement was willful, then it is left to the judge to exercise his or her discretion after trial to determine whether that willful infringement was what we call egregious, particularly bad faith, uh, enough to warrant the awarding of enhanced damages. And if so, it is entirely within the judge's discretion to enhance damages up to three times. So uh, some cases uh, will find egregious willful infringement and not enhance at all or enhance just a little bit. Other cases will enhance all the way up to three times uh, damages. And the Supreme Court has been very clear that that is all left to the discretion of the trial court judge and the federal circuit uh, has been uh, recognizing that discretion and usually upholding what the trial court judge uh, says. I think one other question was uh, whether we are required to award enhanced damages upon a finding of willful infringement. There is no requirement. It is within our discretion to either do so or to not do so. Um, 
I do believe under the law we would have the power to enhance damages even if no one asked us to. I don't, I'm not aware of any authority that says we can't do that, uh, but I am unfamiliar with that ever happening. As you might imagine, given the HALO decision and the easier uh, burdens for uh, obtaining enhanced damages, it is the very rare plaintiff, at least in my court, that does not ask me mm -hmm. to enhance damages, but I suppose I could enhance without being asked. Um, um, uh, you mean the, the, uh, all of the plain, uh, patentee always ask for enhanced damages, is it correct? Uh, almost always. It's, almost it's, always. It's, yeah. it's very rare that they yeah, do not yeah, ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, next, uh, Hong, uh, how about in China on these issues? Today,今天讨论的这个问题,在中国,一般情况下,它使用的字眼可能是惩罚性赔偿。the issue under discussion today is, under normal circumstances in China, the word he used might be punitive damages. In China, there is no clear provision on whether there can be punitive damages. in the Chinese law, China's current patent law does not specify whether punitive damages can be awarded, but punitive provisions up to five times the damages have been added in amendments being considered by the Chinese legislature. 根据中国现行的专利法,原告在起诉的时候,可以选择是根据原告的损失或者是被告的获利,以及或者是根据许可费的倍数。According to the current patent law of China, the plaintiff can choose to claim his loss according to the plaintiff's loss or the defendant's profit and or according to the multiple of the license fee. 如果按照上述的方法依然无法得出赔偿的数额的话, 可原告可以请求 if the amount of compensation cannot be obtained according to the above method, the plaintiff can request the court to exercise discretion at least 10,000 yuan and less than 1 million yuan to determine the final amount of compensation. 专利法的修正案从其适用的条件来看是包括恶意以及情节严重这两个情况但是在修正案中对于如何认定被告存在恶意以及情节严重呢是没有做出一个明确的认定这个可能需要中国的最高法院在修正案通过以后通过司法解释
这是比较典型的重复侵权，在中国可能会被认为是适合加倍赔偿的情形。In China, if the court decides that the infringement is established after a certain period of time, the defendant implements the same infringement, which is a typical repeated infringement, and may be considered suitable for double compensation in China. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Actually, I love your translation, Barsin. <laughs> um, and I'm afraid the interpreters lose their job in the near future. Uh, uh, next, uh, Ho Jun, um, how about in Korea on these issues? Thank you for asking. Uh, the amended Patent Act provides travel damages. Paragraph 8 sets forth the court may not damages. May, may award damages, but it may be reasonable for the court to acknowledge the, the enhanced damages only when a right holder specifically claims for the, the enhancement because the principle on right of disposal seems to work against awarding damages not claimed by the party. Paragraph 8 awards enhanced damages when infringement of other patent right or exclusive license was committed willfully. However, the Patent Act is silent on what constitutes willful infringement under paragraph 8. No case has ruled uh, on the standard so far. As the amended Patent Act came into force this July, and the new provision has not yet been applied in an actual case. Willfulness relati relating to patent infringement under paragraph 8 can be defined as a state of mind when the infringer commits the act, all the while knowing that uh, patent infringement will take place by the act. The problem with this definition is what the infringer knows, for example, that uh, the act will result in patent infringement is not an actual fact, but it, uh, but it's a legal fact that is found through assessment and determination and thus may include gray area. I believe we need to come up with a willfulness test distinctly for enhanced damages under the amended patent act that is compatible with Korean civil law and system. In some cases, even when willful infri infringement is acknowledged the damages may not be actually inc inc increased, increased because the multiplier is decided by considering both the aggravating and mitigating factors in paragraph 9. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, let's move to the next topic. Uh, our next topic is about uh, burden of proof. This question is di directed to Leonard from U.S and Hong from China, and Ho Jun from Korea. In principle, uh, the patentee would be responsible for proving the satisfaction of the requirements for enhanced damages and the amount of the enhanced damages. Um, question, uh, at what point is the patentee considered to have met the requirements on the scale of on a scale of one to ten, uh, please uh, uh, choose a specific number between between uh, one to ten. Right? <laughs> and uh, when providing willfulness or bad faith, uh, how crucial are the following factors? Whether an expert provided legal advice, whether the legal advice was reliable and the defendant's attitude after receiving the legal advice. Uh, and uh, are there any indirect facts uh, that parties can claim and use to prove willfulness or bad faith? Or uh, how the defendant refutes those allegations? Um, Leonard, uh, how do you answer? Okay, let me do my best. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, uh, it's a preponderance of the evidence standard in our system for uh, proving willfulness uh, to the jury and for establishing the egregiousness uh, for enhanced damages. So 
Uh, in our system, we say preponderance of the evidence is just slightly more evidence on your side than on the other side. So on a scale of one to 10, I think that's whatever number is just barely more than five. You know, let's say 5.1. Um, in, in proving that, uh, the, uh, our law allows uh, the patentee, for the most part, to rely on, on, on almost any evidence, uh, you know, subject to rules of evidence, but uh, there's, there's very little restriction in the Patent Act on what evidence might potentially uh, be admitted and go to show what the state of mind of the defendant was. One uh, exception to that is we have uh, a statute at section 298 uh, that says the patentee cannot rely on the failure of the accused infringer to obtain advice of legal counsel with respect to infringement. You cannot rely on the absence of the defendants uh, seeking legal advice on the question of infringement as the basis for showing that the infringement was willful. Um, there's a lot of wrinkles and complications uh, to that, but in essence, uh, what it means is if the defendant uh, faced with an accusation of infringement chooses not to consult with an attorney, uh, and that's the only evidence you have that the infringement was willful, you're not going to uh, most likely survive a summary judgment motion to get rid of willfulness because you're not gonna be able to put in front of the jury simply the fact that the defendant did not seek advice of counsel. It's rarely that simple. Uh, typically, there is evidence that the defendant consulted with counsel, but it's unclear, uh, or at least there's fights over whether that was a good faith consultation or whether it was just for show. Uh, there then become issues of, is the defendant relying on that advice or are they not relying on that advice? We have complicated questions then of attorney-client privilege because in say the year of taking discovery prior to trial. The plaintiff wants to find out everything that was shared with the lawyer and was the basis for the lawyer's opinion and cross-examine the lawyer on how good of an opinion it was and did the company really rely on it. So it opens uh, up a lot of interesting and difficult privilege and discovery disputes and sometimes those things do play out in front of the jury, especially if the defendant chooses to rely on advice of counsel, it, that is a defense available to them. If they do, well then that all does get put in front of the jury and it's for the jury to decide how important is it uh, that you did talk to a lawyer and did or did not follow what the lawyer uh, told you. But it becomes very fact specific at that point. Thank you. Um, uh, next, Hong, uh, how about mm -hmm. in China?在中国，如果原告提出的初步的证据，包括被告自己对侵权获利或者是公司整体盈利情况的宣传资料、网站介绍、公司年报等，而以专利侵权相关的账簿资料，主要在被告掌握的情况下，原告可以申请法庭责令
and will not easily accept the opinions of legal experts, such as violation of a court injunction or repeated infringement. Thank you. Thank you, Hong. Um, uh, next, uh, Ho Jun, uh, how about in Korea? Uh, the legal element theory on burden of proof in Korean civil procedure law dictates that it is the right holder who has the burden to prove uh, the factual elements under the law providing for the right. Thus, the patentee has the burden to prove by evidence that the infringer's act of infringement was willful. Meanwhile, the infringer meets his or her burden to refute the willfulness argument simply by persuading the judge to have doubts that the act may not be willful. The default burden of proof under Korean civil procedure law is preponderance of evidence, not clear and convincing evidence. So my score is uh, 5.1, like uh, just stuck. Uh, it is expected that we will see uh, uh, legal briefs by attorneys or patent attorneys often used as evidence for the defense in Korean courts. These legal briefs will be effective only under certain circumstances. First, legal advice from external counsel who special, specializes in patent law is preferred compared to in-house counsels to ensure objectivity. Second, ASIN must include in-depth analysis based on reasonable grounds. It should contain not only the analysis on the patent itself, but also review of prior arts and the recent trend of cases. Third, it is desirable that one gets advices, advice of counsel as soon as possible. Since the infringement may be found prima facie willful uh, from the time the infringe, infringer became to know of the infringing act. For example, when the infringer received notice on infringement from the patentee up to the point he or she receives the legal advice. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Ozun. Um, uh, let's move to the next topic. Uh, our next topic is about factors to consider to calculate the enhanced damages. This question is uh, for Leonard from US and Ozun from Korea. Uh, question, uh, in your country, are there any criteria in calculating enhanced damages in IP right infringement cases? If any, are those criteria set forth by statute or case law? Um, for example, U.S. has read, read factors by case law, uh, and are the requirements uh, inclusive or exhaustive? Are the courts required to go through all of the requirements? Next question. In your country, what steps do uh, the courts uh, follow when uh, adjudicating a lawsuit seeking enhanced damages against infringement on IP rights? In addition, are there any unique features in such adjudication processes? Um, Leonard, please. Yes, thank you. So, and thank you for putting the slide together, which shows you the read factors which were referenced. Um, our statute does not set out what factors the judge must or even may consider in enhancing damages and how much to enhance damages. Uh, many courts, and I have done this many times, rely on these so-called read factors, which are from a federal circuit decision that long predates HALO. Uh, but I think uh, the Federal Circuit has uh, now indicated post-HALO uh, has continued vitality, and it sets out a number of issues that you would think one would want to consider in deciding just how bad, how bad faith, how ill-motivated is it that the defendant did. Um, and you can see them there, you know, copying, uh, did you act in bad faith, can you afford to pay enhanced damages, or is the company going to be put out of business by a punitive sanction? Uh, did you try to avoid infringement? Did you try to design around? Uh, have you done this before? That sort of thing. Uh, so it's very typical now that American courts will consider the read factors. 
There is no obligation that we do so. There's no obligation that we expressly discuss each and every one of them, even if we are applying the read factors, uh, nor are we, of course, limited just to those factors. In any particular case, there may be something uh, unique to that case that really drives the decision whether to uh, enhance damages, and if so, uh, by how much. One of the uh, interesting uh, things that I have seen is some of the factors, the read factors and some other considerations you would think are relevant, are issues that have played out in front of the jury already, but others are not. Remember, the only way to get a court to have the discretion to award enhanced damages is to first prove to the jury that the infringement occurred and was willful. Uh, in doing that, you may have, for instance, presented evidence to the jury that the infringer deliberately copied, uh, and that evidence, if presented, is the same evidence that I am bound to rely on, and I am bound, I think, to defer to the jury's finding that, in fact, the defendant deliberately copied. But if you look at other factors, such as the size and financial condition of the defendant or how close of a case was it, could the defendant actually have realistically thought they might prevail in this case. Those are not issues that evidence is presented to the jury on, and therefore they're left for me to make an assessment. And so what happens is, in the post-trial proceeding, I have to consider lots of different things, some of which there's already evidence on, some of which I'm free to take new evidence on, and I have to make a totality of the circumstances decision and justify it uh, in deciding uh, what to do. And just as a procedural matter, the way that is typically done is we will get additional written submissions, additional briefs after the jury has gone home, uh, sometimes additional presentation of evidence just to the judge, typically an oral argument uh, with various questions uh, that the lawyers will answer, and then we take some time often to write an opinion. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Um, Hozun, please. Uh, for time saving, please move to, ah, yes, thank you. Slide five. <laughs> uh, paragraph nine describes eight factors to consider to calculate the enhanced damages. The uh, subparagraph one is a new factor uh, that has not been used in other existing Korean laws. It is introduced to promote innovate, uh, innovative growth by active technology transfer and eliminate incentives to rip off technologies from small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, the subparagraph sub two corresponds to the first, second, and eight read factors. Since the first and second read factors carry the most weight in determ determining whether enhanced damages should be awarded, so subparagraph two appears to be the most important one among paragraphs nine. Criminal monetary penalty under subparagraph 6 is included in order to avoid the concern of double punishment. It is taken into account in order to reduce economic burden of the infringer of poor financial ability. Therefore, it is considered as one of the uh, factors to mitigate the damages award. It would be reasonable to treat the factors in the subparagraphs paragraphs as exemplary, not exhaustive. Thus, criminal, uh, uh, circumstance, uh, circumstantial evidence not listed in the above paragraph should be considered too if it helps to assess culpability inherent in the, in the infringing act. Thank you. Thank you, Hojun. Our next topic is about the specific uh, cases uh, involving enhanced damages. The uh, U.S. Uh, has long history of the enhanced damages against patent infringement. Uh, so U.S. has quite a number of court cases related with enhanced damages. Therefore, uh, this question is directed to you only, Leonard, because you are U.S. delegation. Um, the question, um, each year in how many cases are enhanced damages awarded 
against willful infringement or on patent. And in cases uh, where uh, a court finds willful infringement, how many times are the damages enhanced on average? What factors contributed uh, to, the, to the increase in damages in each case? Uh, are there any considerations or criteria that uh, you rely on when determining how much to enhan enhance the damages in cases involving uh, willful infringement? Uh, Leonard, please. Yes, thank you uh, for those questions. So um, I would first uh, just say as a preference, uh, uh, you do have a lot of detail in the materials uh, that we uh, prepared. I'm not going to go through each of the many cases that are discussed there, but as uh, uh, has been noted, there are a lot of cases uh, in our system that consider willful infringement. Not that many as a percentage-wise that actually grant the enhanced damages, and I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment. But as a, as a further preference, as um, I think many of you understand, our system at the district court level is uh, rather decentralized. Uh, we have 94 different district courts, and each court consists of a number of district court judges. Mine has four district court judges. My colleague, Judge Alsop, has a much bigger court, probably around 20 district court judges, and not every court handles these matters the same way, and not every judge within the same court handles them the same way. One particular thing that varies a great deal is whether we write opinions on issues such as enhanced damages. Uh, I just outlined a moment ago how I typically will take the time to write an opinion after trial and explain my reasoning in writing, applying many of the read factors, but I'm not obligated to do that. And so I do also fairly frequently rule from the bench, meaning I will have a, a hearing with the parties, we'll talk about the read factors, I'll take a short break, and then I'll go back in and I'll just talk, and I will make a decision uh, and announce it orally, uh, whether I'm enhancing damages, and if so, by how much and why. Uh, why do I say all of this? Uh, it's to uh, explain that it's not as easy as you might think to give you the type of hard data that the questions are seeking. Uh, there are various sources that I've consulted to try to give you some sense as to the numbers of cases where uh, enhanced damages are awarded, but it's not as easy to track as you might think given the great variety and how these decisions are made and where they are kept or sometimes in my instance, it would be very hard to find a record of even every one that I did uh, because they're only in the case file for that particular case. All that said, um, every source that I've been able to find indicates a couple of things. In the post-HALO time period, so since 2016, we are seeing an increased number of applications for willful infringement and an increased number and percentage that are granted. Uh, the data that uh, was presented at the Federal Circuit Bar Association meeting that I was uh, just at in Honolulu with your colleague, Judge Jiang, uh, indicates that uh, around 54% of the uh, enhanced damages requests are being granted, uh, which compares to only about a 35% grant rate prior to HALO. And that makes sense given the greater discretion that has been given to district court judges after HALO. Uh, in terms of the amount of damages that the enhancement uh, is uh, when it's awarded, um, that has gone down, interestingly enough. The data that was presented in Hawaii indicates that the average multiplier is 2.1 so roughly a doubling of damages in the post-HALO timeframe, whereas pre-HALO, it was 2.5. So the trend seems to be, and, and I think in my court, we're, we're fairly consistent with this. Uh, it's easier, it, you're asked much more often to enhance damages. It's easier to get enhanced damages. We're probably seeing a significant increase in the number of times 
that enhanced damages are awarded, but the multiplier rate is somewhat less uh, than it had been. Um, when I'm uh, considering uh, these issues, of course, I look at the read factors, but I think at a, at a high level, what I have in mind are the interests of deterrence and punishment. Uh, so while I have to consider, I don't have to consider, but I do consider each of the read factors, I think what I'm often struggling to do is come up with an overall sense of, do I think what this defendant did is really bad? Uh, do I think they should not have done it? And do I want to help in whatever little way I can to send a message to other companies, other potential infringers, that you should not behave the way uh, this infringer uh, did? Um, so in, in answering those questions, uh, I'm very focused often on how close of a case was this? I will often go back and think to myself about, for instance, the claim construction stage. Uh, at claim construction, uh, did the defendant persuade me on any of the claim construction disputes, or did they just walk into court and have various extreme and unreasonable positions as to how they thought I might interpret the claims? How difficult did I find it to resolve the claim construction disputes? How difficult did I find it to deny the motion for summary judgment of non-infringement? If at the end of the case, right before trial, the defendant asked me to end the case by granting summary judgment of no infringement, and I spent a lot of time thinking that through, and maybe I wrote a draft opinion that at one point was coming out on the defendant's side because I didn't think the plaintiff could prove infringement, but then at the last minute, maybe I changed my mind and said, well, it's a close call, I'll give it to the plaintiff and we'll have a trial. If the case was like that, and there were real times that I know the defendant might have won the case and been completely free and clear, uh, that's a case that I'm less likely to find was egregious bad faith infringement. It's a case I'm gonna be less likely to think I should be punishing the defendant and less likely to think that other defendants should behave differently uh, than this one. Um, so that's part of the process I go through in evaluating uh, these motions. Um, it, 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 I did uh, set out for you, you can find examples across the country of uh, cases um, uh, that come out really any particular way because uh, hopefully I've helped explain, it really is very fact and case specific driven. So you can find plenty of cases where the jury found willful infringement and the judge said I'm not enhancing anyway and here's why. You can find some cases where the judge was, was not happy with what the defendant did but not extraordinarily unhappy and so they might in a sort of nominal fashion increase damages to like a 1.1 or 1.5 uh, ratio and then you can find plenty of cases in the two to three time damages uh, range which seems to be the average from the data that I uh, shared with you um, all the way up to the cases where the judge feels uh, this is a, a real example of how a defendant should not behave and I want to make that clear, so I'm going right up to the maximum of what the statute allows, and I'm trebling damages. So you can, you can find examples of, of all of those, and we've set that out in the written response. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, a very quick, uh, one, one more question. And, and in your answer, uh, your, your written answer, um, you, you said, uh, based on my research, and consistent with my experience, courts only rarely grant enhanced damages, you said. Uh, my question is, uh, we often hear about uh, eye-popping verdict on damages in US, very huge amount of damages, uh, but you said US courts are rarely grant enhanced damages, why? Is there any relations between the huge amount of damages and the multiple in, in enhanced damages? Yes, so thank you. And um, I should clarify, uh, the, the data 
that I shared with you today that I received in Hawaii was not data I had when I wrote the written response. I think uh, what I had in mind when I said we rarely do it is if you look at the full totality of the roughly 1,000 patent cases a year that are filed, I think you're only going to find somewhere in the you know 30 to 50 a year that will go all the way through trial, prevail on willful infringement, and get an enhanced damages award. Um, the data uh, that I shared with you that about 54 uh, percent are awarded, that is in the instance where you've already f found willful infringement at trial, and now all that's left is to ask the judge should there be enhanced damages as a result of this finding of uh, willfulness. So just a little clarification there. Um, in terms of damages, awards, yes, sometimes they can be eye-popping. Um, uh, understand that uh, a judge also can be asked to lower uh, those damages awards, and, and that is often a motion uh, that we get when the award is, uh, is eye-popping. Um, and yes, I do think as a practical matter, uh, the uh, higher the amount of damages the jury has war awarded for compensation can factor into, in the judge's exercise of discretion, whether they should enhance further. And in that regard, I, I have uh, this Identix case that I think was referenced in somebody's presentation uh, the other day, maybe yesterday, um, which uh, is currently on appeal, so there's not that much I can say about it, but it was a $2.3 billion, billion with a B, uh, jury damages award in a patent infringement case. And then the plaintiff did come in and ask me to enhance that uh, by basically doubling it. And uh, I did say in that case that one of the factors in not enhancing it was how big uh, the award uh, on compensatory damages was. So we're free to consider anything, and uh, I do think that uh, that can be a real-world uh, factor in your decision. Thank you very much, Leonard. Um, let's move to the next topic. Uh, next topic is about collection of evidence for willful in infringement. Uh, this question is directed to Leonard uh, from US and Hong from China and Kisu uh, from Korea. Question, uh, establishing the intent of an infringer such as willfulness or bad faith often relies on indirect or circumstantial evidence what types of evidence can be used uh, to prove willfulness or bad faith? Is there any statute or system that forces an infringer to furnish its documents required for proving willful infringement, such as documents regarding the development history of the infringing product? And uh, legal reviews on whether the product infringed on patent. Could you elaborate about these statutes and or uh, systems in further detail? And how is the evidence regarding willful infringement collected in lawsuits in practice? I'm sorry, you two, Leonard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm very sorry to repeatedly asking you, <laughs> you <laughs> I feel sorry. I, I, I'm a proud member of the House of Stark, so I, I'm, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the question. Um, so I, really, I, our federal rules of civil procedure set out uh, numerous opportunities for both parties to take discovery of one another, and discovery on issues related to willfulness and enhanced damages really comes within the scope of those more general rules of uh, discovery. So over the course of the 12 to 18 months, uh, typically in my court, of pretrial litigation, uh, the patentee is asking the defendant to produce documents, uh, to answer written questions, uh, to have witnesses sit for depositions, to answer oral questions. Um, and uh, it is completely uh, acceptable and uh, the standard, in fact, that uh, you will ask uh, questions and seek documents that relate to willfulness. Because the willfulness test is a now a basically totality of the circumstances and a subjective intent of the defendant test, 
almost anything uh, that a clever lawyer can think of can arguably be made to sound relevant to that inquiry. So uh, we do see a lot of disputes during the discovery process where the plaintiff might ask the defendant to um, you know, disclose documents that go to every bad thing that that company has ever done, even if it doesn't relate directly to the patent, uh, in an effort to maybe try and build a case that this is a, a bad faith actor in our economy. Uh, the defendant has the right to say no, this is overbroad, this is uh, too burdensome to me, this is not truly related to the case at hand. Uh, and when the parties can't work those disputes out, then they file motions in front of the court. And part of our job in the pretrial process is to police those types of discovery uh, disputes. Um, but uh, all of that evidence uh, is, is well within the realm of uh, what is uh, typically asked for. We see particular struggles, uh, at least in my court, over electronic mail and uh, more broadly electronic discovery. Uh, companies now have a massive amount of data uh, you know, that is stored electronically and uh, uh, plaintiffs often want to just see as much as they can in hopes that you know, maybe late one night one engineer sent an email to another engineer saying you know, did you see the latest product or patent of our competitor? Uh, we're in terrible shape. There's no way we can deal with this other than to just copy it, something to that effect. And as we all know, being busy people and we're not always at our best every moment, uh, if you look hard enough in a large corporation, you might find an email uh, like that. And uh, a, a plaintiff's willful infringement case uh, can rely heavily on sort of colorful uh, uh, documents uh, like that. So plaintiffs are often looking for that and defendants are often trying their best to resist having to search for that type of material. Thank you, Leonard. Um, Hong, uh, how about in China? Oh, sorry. In China. 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 In 应具有雇用、代理、许可使用等关系，明知他人知识产权存在的。Under normal circumstances, the following situations can be considered as intentional infringement, such as employing agents, licensing, and other relationships, knowing the existence of intellectual property rights of others。或者是。收到他人有效的侵权警告后，没有停止侵权行为的，或者因为侵权被行政机关的处罚或司法机关判决承担责任后，再一次实施同意侵权行为的，这种以上的情形都通常在中国会被认为是具有侵权的故意。or after receiving effective infringement warning from others, failing to stop the infringing act or committing the same infringing act again after being punished by the administrative organ or judged to be liable by the judicial organ because of the infringement, which are usually considered as intentional infringement in China. 根据中国的最高法院的规定,如果苏正在对方当事人的控制之下的承担举证责任的当事人,可以在举证期限届满之前 书面申请法院责令对方当事人提交 According to China's Supreme Court, if documentary evidence is under the control of the other party, the party bearing the burden of proof may apply in writing to the court to order the other party to submit it before the expiration of the time limit for proof. 在中国的专利侵权案件中, 越来越多的当事人会寻求 申请法院责令被告提交相关的侵权财务资料用于证明其损失。More and more litigants in patent infringement cases in China will seek to file with the courts ordering defendants to submit relevant infringing financial information as proof of damages. Thank you. Thank you, Hong. Um, uh, 
Uh, next, uh, Gisu, please. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And again, uh, happy birthday, Hongdu. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, for the questions, uh, Leonard, Hong, and Ho Jun covered lots of important points already. Uh, so I think I don't have much to add on this topic. Uh, recently, I've heard a very skeptical opinion on enhanced damage in Korea. Uh, that is this. Uh, even though an enhanced damage system was introduced in the Korean pattern law, it would be almost impossible to prove the requirement for enhanced damages in real cases because the evidence related to the intentions such as the defendant's research and development documents for infringing products uh, will be kept as confidential materials. And in Korea, uh, where there is no discovery system like the United States, it is quite challenging for plaintiff to obtain the defendant's internal documents in civil proceedings. Uh, that's understandable opinion, but I do not agree with that. In 2017, the Korean pattern law introduced a new material submission order system on Article 132. The submission order can be granted for material, uh, number one, related to the proof of infringement, or number two, necessary to calculate damages resulting from infringement. I think it can be construed that the material necessary to calculate damages includes the material necessary to calculate enhanced damages. If so, I think it will be possible for plaintiff to obtain the materials in order to prove intentional infringement. Of course, uh, it may be inappropriate to allow the plaintiff to be able to collect an, uh, a limited amount of defendant's confidential materials in the name of proving infringement. So the court may hold an in-camera hearing to compare the need to have the confidential materials for the plaintiff and the need to protect trade secrets for defendants. And the court uh, may issue a protective order to those who will have access to secrets if necessary. In this way, I think the procedure to obtain evidence to enhance damages can have substantial fairness. Thank you. Thank you, Gisu. Um, our next topic is uh, to all countries. Uh, please be prepared. Uh, next topic is about evidence collection for damages. Uh, uh, this topic is not about enhanced damages only. Uh, it's about ordinary damages. Question. Uh, it's a, quite a long question, and please uh, be aware and uh, please uh, try to answer briefly, less than three minutes. Um, question, uh, is there any, any system or measure uh, that uh, forces an infringer to furnish its materials to determine the amount of damages, such as accounting documents uh, regarding sales and profits? To obtain an order for submission of materials required for determining uh, damages, to what extent uh, should the patentee applying for the order specify uh, the required materials? If such materials cannot be specified because of certain reasons, uh, is the patentee uh, allowed to request a, a broad category of materials? Uh, during the application phase uh, for a material submission order, is there any procedure for identifying the required materials, such as 
on-site investigation or a procedure involving experts. Uh, accounting documents may often uh, constitute trade secrets of the infringing party. If the infringing party uh, refuses to furnish the materials on the grounds of confidentiality, is there any court procedure that forces the party uh, to furnish the materials? In cases where an infringing party claims that uh, it does not possess the materials ordered by the court, is there any procedure to verify the existence of the materials? In cases where an infringing party refuses uh, to comply with a uh, court submission order, uh, what are the disadvantages against the infringing party? How about it is found to have made a false statement regarding the possession of materials? Um, James, you are the first. Uh, please answer briefly. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, the uh, briefest of answer is that there are in the UK proceed procedures to deal with all of those points. Uh, to understand uh, in more detail, uh, the, um, uh, the, the way to consider it is first of all uh, the basic allegations of the parties for each stage of the case are set out in writing and pleaded so that it's possible to identify the disputed issues between the parties. M almost all IP cases are tried in a way in which we deal with liability first, which can deal with whether the infringement of, say, copyright was flagrant and therefore whether there are going to be additional damages. And then secondly, to deal with the question of um, the amount of financial compensation. Uh, so quant quantum. Because there's a choice usually between damages or an account of profits, there's an early stage of disclosure to elect between the two called Island Records and Tring Disclosure. And then there's a pleading of the claim for damages, including the various heads of damages involved. And then the courts have procedures to allow for uh, disclosure of documents, and it's in this historic context that originally our procedure was that you could have, you, you would have automatic disclosure of all documents that supported a party's case or undermined a party's case or led to a train of inquiry into documents that might do either of those things. That led to vast volumes of documents, and, and, and so there has been a process of trying to make disclosure more efficient, and the most modern version now is our business and property courts procedure that's summarized um, uh, in, in the notes from page 337, where there is an immediate obligation to disclose um, adverse documents, so documents that undermine your case or support the other side's case, to disclose documents you rely upon with your pleading, and then the court has a menu of options, uh, uh, disclosure models, which can be ordered, and the parties can apply. And once disclosure's been given, then the parties can apply for additional disclosure orders, whether it's specific classes of documents or inspection of computer systems. And if there's a failure to um, provide proper disclosure at one stage, then the danger for a non-disclosing party, amongst many, is that it will be the subject of a more um, uh, intrusive disclosure order, such as all computer systems have to be imaged and the image is made available to the other side's um, experts to trawl through, uh, which has happened in a case that I was involved in, um, uh, and um, there are punitive um, options as well. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Oliver, uh, how about in Germany? Thank you for this question. Um, in Germany, we do have a little bit different system because in IP cases, damages are normally not calculated, 
but um, the judgment contains, um, in addition to injunction, um, the obligation of the defendant to provide all necessary information to be able to calculate damages and the declaration that damages have to be paid. So it means that the case is over with this decision and if um, the parties cannot settle, they do have to start a new case. Um, the order normally contains obligation to provide all the documents that are necessary to calculate the damages, including the origin and uh, distribution channel, and also documents that are necessary to be able to check if the given information are true. So it means that a lot of documents have to be um, provided. Um, in fact, um, in my court, we do have like 100 patent cases a year. I would say less than 10, maybe less than five are concerning calculation of damages because parties do settle. You mean the five case, just five case or five percent? Uh, uh, since we have 100 cases, it's Same. similar, but... Um, uh-huh, yeah, 100 cases, yeah, I, I see, I see. Right. Um, it's it's, a, it's a about a five percent. I mean, sometimes it's more, but it's, it's not so much. Uh -huh. And even the cases um, where they asked for damages, they will settle after uh -huh. a certain time uh, because uh, calculation is difficult. I would also like to mention that generally there's a claim for disclosure in Germany, which is based on European Union enforcement directive, where it's able, where you're able to ask the court to get an injunction that some documents will be disclosed, disclosed before trial. Um, but uh, it's not very popular because these documents will not be given to the party as such, but in most cases, in order to keep the secrets, they will be given to a sequester or like a third party who has obligation to keep secret. So it's more to ensure that the defendant is not manipulating documents. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Oliver. Um, yeah, Thierry, um, house in Switzerland. Yes, thank you very much. Yes. Um, so if, if a patenteer, a plaintiff, uh, would like to seek um, compensation, and when I talk about compensation, that, that could be damages, as mentioned in the question, but it could also be a kind of profits, um, it's just uh, to, as in the UK. And there, alternatively, the third alternative would be reasonable royalty rates. So these three um, you know, different types of compensation would be possible, and the election would only have to be made at a later stage. But, but it's actually in Switzerland, there's three different legal bases for these three different types of compensation. So if a plaintiff, you know, would like to seek compensation, then he will actually, um, the, the proceedings will be bifurcated. So in, in a first stage, there will be the, the question of liability, um, you know, whether there is a patent infringement and then there will also be, the court will, will decide on the order uh, requiring the defendant to furnish the accounting materials and everything. And it's only in the second stage that the plaintiff will have to um, quantify the compensation and, and make the election out of these three types that I mentioned. Um, so the, you know, you asked about the, you know, the request, you know, to furnish materials. So as I said, um, the plaintiff will, will basically ask, um, you know, as specifically as possible, but, but, but I mean, this is going to be fairly broad in terms of it's, it's all the information that you need in order to, to quantify, you, you know, your compensation. So that would be um, besides names and addresses of commercial purchases of the product, it would be the quantities of the products um, that were sold, um, the infringing products, you know, ordered and or delivered and then broken in down into you know each individual customer, um, it would be manufacturing costs, um, purchase prices, and other expenses, which can be directly allocated to the infringement. So, so it's going to be you know this kind of information that the plaintiff will request, and then you know as a decision in the first stage, there will be apart from the injunction, the permanent injunction that is typically asked for, there will be an order requiring the defendant to furnish all these documents. There is no. Um, on-site investigation or, or any 
on-site procedural available in this respect, as, the, as you had asked, um, but the defendant has an obligation to furnish these materials. Um, and, and it is important that um, the defendant is not able to invoke grounds of confidentiality with regard to the patent infringement. Um, there may be other data um, which are not relevant for the quantification uh, of the, you know, this particular patent infringement. And, you know, these data can be, there are procedures to kind of, you know, for instance, redact that information or keep it confidential, you know, for instance, by appointing a court expert or something. Um, but, but typically that is, is there is an obligation. And so you asked, you know, what will happen if the um, defendant does not comply with that order? So, so there are various possibilities. Um, th there could be um, actually the, the actual order of the court could be combined with, um, you know, criminal provisions. So then that would amount to contempt of court, um, or it could be financial sanctions. So there's a possibility to ask for um, a daily fine, like for each day of non-compliance, which would be a thousand francs in maximum. But that's money that's going to go to the court that's not going to go to the plaintiff. So that's not a, what we call an ostrant from the French system. It is actual money that would go to the court. And finally, the court could also draw adverse inference from non-compliance. Um, there has actually been, you know, few cases. And, and also, I must add that just as uh, Judge Schoen said, in Switzerland, it's the same. It's maybe only about 10% or even less of the cases that actually proceed to the second stage of, of damages or compensation. Um, and there was just, uh, you know, one case where um, the defendant was, I think, from Hong Kong, um, and, and there was just simply no information that was provided, and so the plaintiff was basically able to make it up. It just had to be reasonable, but the plaintiff had to make it up um, on the basis of the facts available, and the court actually, um, you know, mm -hmm. gave that, that quantum. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Thierry. Uh, very interesting. Um, next, uh, Takahumi, uh, how about in Japan? Yeah. Um, I suppose uh, Japanese court system has a similar court system to the um, Korean system uh, regarding uh, evidence collection. Uh, the Court of Civil Procedure of Japan has general provisions on document submission order. In, uh, in addition, uh, the intellectual property laws of Japan, uh, for example, Patent Act, the Trademark Act, uh, the Copyright Act, etc., uh, state rules for the, the order document uh, submission as special provisions to calculate damages. Uh, these special provisions uh, supplement and enhance the general submission order of the Code of Civil Procedure. And to apply, to apply for a document submission order, uh, patentee must specify the indication of the document, um, the purpose of the document, and uh, the person in possession of the document in accordance with the civil code, sorry, a code of civil procedure. And for the purpose um, to distinguish the um, requested document from the other documents, uh, the petitioner for the order must specify the name the written date and the writer of the document. If it is difficult to disclose the indication or purpose of the document, uh, the petitioner shall motion to the, motion the court to request the person in possession of the document uh, to clarify these particulars. And in practice, uh, there are some cases that court may permit specified to be general. And um, after the document submission order was issued, the person in possession of the document uh, may reject um, document sub submission order uh, if uh, there are reasonable grounds. The fact that his document involves private secrets um, does not merely fall under reasonable ground. Uh, and the court determines whether or not a uh, document must be submitted by um, comparing, by comparing the um, determined to the person in possession of the document 
if the document is released. And the detriment to the petitioner if um, it is not released. So, oh. If the infringing party does not comply with the, the order to submission, um, the court may find that uh, the adverse party's allegations concerning the details of the document to be true. Um, furthermore, if it is extremely difficult for the adverse party to make specific allegations in connection with the details of the document, um, and to prove the fact that it's not, uh, sorry, it's to be proven by the document, by the, the other document, the court may found that, find that the adverse party's allegation concerning such facts are true. I couldn't find any case uh, where an infringing party submitted fake documents, um, but my personal opinion would be that uh, it is identical to uh, not complying with an order to submit a document. Um, uh, that's my explanation on the document submission order for calculating them in Japan. Thank you, Takahumi. Uh, next, uh, Hong, how about in China? <coughs> As I was saying just now. In China, if the plaintiff meets the preliminary conditions, he can apply to the court to order the defendant to submit relevant evidentiary materials. 中国的最高法院对于责令被告提交文书目前暂时还没有程序的规定，主要是由各地法院在具体的案件中根据实际的情况具体来掌握如何操作责令提交程序。China's Supreme Court currently has no provisions on procedures for ordering defendants to submit documents. It is mainly up to local courts to master how to operate and order submission procedures in specific cases according to the actual situation. 如果被告根据法庭的命令提交了相关的材料,法庭往往会要求原告、被告以及相关的诉讼参与人签署保证书,保证不会泄露其所 掌握、看到以及展示等方式所了解到的跟提交方所交的材料相关的这些信息，否则呢可能会承担相应的法律责任，例如会被法院罚款等。if the defendant submits relevant materials according to the court's order, the court will often require the plaintiff, defendant, and relevant participants in the proceedings to sign an undertaking that they will not disclose information related to the materials submitted by the submitting party that they have access to, see, and display. Otherwise, they may bear corresponding legal responsibilities, such as being fined by the court, 在中国来讲，目前被告能够按照法庭的命令提供相应的资料的还是比较少的情形，或者有时候提供的资料并不完整。在这种情况下，法院往往会根据原告的材料推定相应的主张成立，所以在这种情况下，原告往往能获得比他
提供不完整的文书的情况下，可能会对他造成不利的诉讼后果。In China, the court will not force the defendant to provide documents, but if the defendant refuses to provide documents or provides incomplete documents, it may cause unfavorable litigation consequences to him. Thank you, Hong. Uh, next, uh, Kisu, uh, how about in Korea? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, instead of presenting all my answers to these questions, uh, I would like to introduce a brief history and background of the new change in the evidence collection procedures for damage calculation in patent infringement litigation. In order to calculate damages, it is essential to secure the defendant's accounting documents. However, according to the previous practice of the co Korean patent litigation, there was no way for the plaintiff to obtain such documents. In some cases, the court ordered the defendant to submit accounting documents, but the defendant generally refused to submit documents for reasons of trade secrets. And even there was no penalty for not submitting. So the amount of damages calculated through the patent infringement litigation was inevitably smaller than the defendant's actual profit. Some companies noticed this limitation of patent litigation and strategically opted for infringing rather than developing new technologies or negotiating for licensing contract. This kind of perception may threaten the patent system. Uh, as you know, in order for the patent infringement litigation to function to suppress patent infringement, sufficient compensation must be calculated. That's why the Korean patent law introduced the new material submission order system in 2017. The new system prevents the defendant from refusing to submit accounting documents, even if it is a trade secret. And it is so powerful system that allows penalties to defendant for recognizing the plaintiff's claim as true in the case of not submitting documents as ordered. Uh, thanks to the introduction of the material submission order, now, uh, most of the defendant have submitted accounting documents in patent infringement litigation. However, uh, there are still many cases where it is difficult to calculate damages by documents submitted by infringer because it is unreliable or inadequate or insufficient. I think that the development of the practice in this area is still in progress. If the practice of the sub submitting order is settled enough, I expect that damage calculation can be made uh, based on more accurate evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Gisu. Um, um, uh, next, uh, the Leonard, um, you may have answered these questions already. Um, and do you have any more comments? Uh, yes, thank you. A little bit. Um, it, it is correct, uh, as I've already said, that uh, collection of evidence for damages is governed by our same uh, discovery rules that govern the collection of all types of evidence. Uh, that allows one to ask for documents in broad categories, provided that you state with reasonable particularity what the type of document is that you want. The standard of what needs to be produced thereafter is merely relevance and that the materials appear to be likely to lead to the discovery of evidence that would be admissible at trial. So it's a fairly broad standard. Uh, bifurcation has been touched on. Uh, it's again hard to make uh, general statements for what the trend is across the entire country, but in my court, Whereas I would say about 15 years ago, it was typical 
to bifurcate damages issues from liability issues for, for discovery purposes. That is no longer uh, very common in our court. It is much more common, uh, overwhelmingly the norm in our court, that discovery on damages takes place at the same time as discovery on liability issues. And the reason for that is a belief uh, that um, the parties really need to understand fairly early on in the process how much money is at stake in this case uh, because there was a sense that uh, when we bifurcated more commonly, uh, the plaintiff might push a case all the way to trial and prove liability only to find out thereafter that the defendant really wasn't making very much money on the product and therefore there was not very much that the plaintiff was going to recover. So in order to avoid that, uh, we almost always will require the exchange of uh, damages related discovery uh, simultaneous with the uh, discovery on liability uh, issues. Um, uh, there is provision and it happens in almost every patent case for a protective order to be put in place. So uh, it is not a valid objection to a request for discovery for the defendant to say, well, that's very confidential, sensitive commercial information. I don't want the other side to see it. Uh, we will, in, in that instance, we'll work out a protective order that might in fact limit some of the discovery to only going to the outside lawyer for the plaintiff or to the expert who's going to testify on discovery. It may well be that people inside the plaintiff's company are not per permitted to see the information, but the plaintiff as a litigating entity represented by counsel has a right to see the relevant uh, information. And in the rare instance that somebody does not comply with their discovery obligation, uh, do not turn over the relevant evidence that they're required to turn over. Uh, we have a range of sanctions available. Uh, most commonly, it would be a financial uh, sanction. Uh, the party might be made to pay the costs that uh, the, the plaintiff incurred in bringing the dispute to the court and maybe a small financial penalty. If it's more egregious than that, then we can uh, impose an adverse inference uh, and tell the jury that uh, something bad was done in discovery and you should assume that the defendant did it in order to keep uh, damaging information from you. Uh, or in the worst instance, we actually could grant judgment uh, against the party that did not comply with their discovery obligations. And happily, I have not seen it, but if there were a case where evidence was being fabricated, actually falsely created or destroyed, I would think a motion for entry of judgment uh, would get serious consideration in that unusual circumstance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Leonard. Um, um, James? Um, uh, you are a very much experienced lawyer in IP field. Um, um, do you have any know-how you can share with us uh, that you use uh, to ensure efficient collection of evidence for willful infringement and damages? Y yes. Uh, the the know-how one has to think of in in two areas. There's, there's first of all the legal mechanisms and then there's the use of those mechanisms. Uh, uh, the, the, the mechanisms that are effective are having clear structures by which the, the information is to be provided and then effective rules for you to allow um, uh, those to be put into motion uh, and speedy access to the court to acquire documents in accordance uh, with those structures. So uh, I in our intellectual property courts, uh, the uh, initial orders for disclosure take place at case management conferences, which happen um, quickly after the, issue the issues in dispute are set out in the pleadings. So for instance, in our intellectual property um, enterprise court, the CMC date has to be fixed two weeks after the defense has been filed, so before the end of close of pleadings, once you know there are parties on both sides. 
uh, and then applications where a party is saying, well, hold on a moment, you need to provide these additional documents can be dealt with quickly because the application notice just has to be on three clear days notice. And that usually means that hearings take place within um, uh, uh, a week or two um, of um, a party um, identifying that there's an issue which the court needs to decide upon. Uh, and then um, uh, there comes uh, uh, the sanctions uh, for non-compliance, um, and those are powerful and uh, graded uh, in, in, in a similar way to the examples that um, Judge Stark was talking about. Um, so uh, uh, it's useful to think about uh, the, um, the sanctions uh, according to their strength. Uh, and the strongest ones are the ones that avoid this be being a problem. So to start with, failure to comply with orders for disclosure and obligations on disclosure are a contempt of court and punishable by imprisonment and fine, though the breach has to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, so that is a strong uh, uh, motivator for the parties to comply uh, in addition to that, there are obligations on the lawyers involved, which means that when they know their, part, that their, their clients are not complying with their obligations on disclosure, they are under an obligation to advise their clients to comply and to tell them that they will have to cease acting for them if they fail to comply. They don't have to disclose to the court that their clients have done something wrong because that would be a breach of privilege. But that's a very strong motivator for clients to comply with their disclosure obligations because otherwise they lose this team of lawyers and have to instruct new lawyers. Uh, another thing that happens um, is that if a picture unravels at trial, or you see that disclosure hasn't been provided or false documents have been provided, is that um, as well as the risk of the contempt application later, a judge can sometimes reach the conclusion that he's going to pass a file of information to the Director of Public Prosecutions for somebody to be prosecuted for perjury. And I've been involved in a case where a judge has indicated that unless there's an explanation, that's likely to be what will happen at the end of a case um, to the party on the other side. Uh, and then... Um, we also have the principle that if it's clear that documents are missing because they've been destroyed or there's been a, 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 a deliberate process of getting rid of documents, whether or not it's in breach of a disclosure order, then adverse inferences can be drawn, uh, basically uh, uh, to identify um, uh, 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 the... Uh, for, for the assumptions to be made against the defendant to the greatest extent that the factual matrix allows. And that dates back to a case called Armory and Dalmiri um, uh, in 1722 when a chimney sweep found a boy sent up a chimney to clean, found a jewel and took it to a jeweler to sell. Um, and the jeweler offered him a small amount of money and refused to give the jewel back. Uh, held that uh, the jury was to assume uh, the, uh, that it was the highest quality of gems consistent with the mount that was in evidence. Thank you, James. Um, um, we, uh, we have only 22 minutes left. And, uh, and you, uh, you, saw, you may saw, see this... Uh, this paper on the table uh, will announce the case of a result uh, shortly uh, at the end of the uh, session. Uh, if you not answered the survey yet, please respond right now. The case survey questionnaire is placed on your table and you can use the QR code uh, to answer the survey and you can also answer the survey using the down application and neighbor application. Yeah. Uh, our uh, next topic uh, is about damages calculation and the roles of experts. This topic is not about enhanced damages only. Uh, it is about ordinary damages. Uh, so this question is directed to all countries. Question, um, do the courts in your 
country retain experts to review damages for patent infringement. Uh, could you tell us about uh, what types of experts are retained and what roles they play? What procedures uh, are for the participation of experts in court proceedings? In cases uh, where the accounting document furnished by an infringing party is unreliable or incomplete, uh, what roles can experts play in determining damages? Rather than ordering an infringing party uh, to furnish all accounting documents, would it be possible uh, to appoint an accounting expert to review the infringing party's document? After that, the expert can submit an appraisal report and the court can use the report uh, to establish damages. Uh, first, Hong, um, how do you answer these questions? In China, 只有在原告主张按照被告获利的情况下，才会考虑要被告则法庭责令被告提供相应的资料。In China, a defendant is only considered if the plaintiff claims to have benefited from the defendant's action, and the court orders the defendant to produce the information. 如果被告向法庭提交了财务。合同等相关的资料的情况下，法院会委托相关的审计机构对被告所提供的材料进行审计，在必要的情况下，会到被告的财务资料的存放处进行原件的核对。if the defendant submits financial contracts and other relevant information to the court, the court will entrust the relevant audit institutions to audit the materials provided by the defendant, and if necessary, it will check the original of the defendant's financial information. <咳>对于审计机构出具的审计报告会在法庭上接受案件各方当事人的执政 由法庭根据执政的情况来确定，被告是否提供了完整的资料以及这个案件的相关的资料与案件的关联性，以及是否可具有采信性。For the audit report issued by the audit institution, the court will accept the ruling of the parties to the case, and the court will determine whether the defendant has provided complete information according to the ruling situation and whether the relevant information of the case is relevant to the case and whether it can be informative. 如果通过审计发现被告提供的资料不完整或者是故意隐瞒了相关的资料可能会导致对被告不利的诉讼后果 if the audit finds that the defendant provides incomplete information or intentionally conceals relevant information, it may lead to adverse litigation consequences for the defendant. 在中国审计的时候，审计师往往会参考中国的相关的行业协会所发布的相应的一些调查报告，因为这些报告中可能涉及利润率。这个相关的重要的财务指标，就行业的重要的财务指标。When auditing in China, auditors often refer to some corresponding survey reports issued by relevant industry associations in China because these reports may involve the important financial indicators of profit margin, which are important financial indicators of the industry. 对于审计报告如果存在瑕疵无法直接采用的情况下
If the audit report has defects and cannot be directly used, it is also an important reference for the court. The court will not directly use the audit report, but refer to the relevant data content of the audit report as well as other evidence of the case can also use discretion to determine the amount of compensation above the statutory compensation in China and ultimately determine the amount of compensation. Thank you, uh, thank you Hong. Um, next, Takahumi, uh, how about in Japan? Uh, in Japan, the procedure for obtaining expert opinion generally include um, appointing a technical advisor, um, adopting, adopting the appraisal by an expert and um, appointing an expert calculator after submitting the case for civil consideration. So uh, the Patent Act speci specifically uh, stipulates that the adverse party has an obligation to explain to the expert witness all methods necessary for the calculation of damages. Uh, the Determination of damages of, from patent infringement uh, makes use the, the appraisal of the calculation by an expert. Um, such a uh, certified public accountant specializing in bookkeeping and accounting is suitable as the expert witness because uh, the appraisal of the, the calculation requires wide-ranging professional experience, uh, including accounting, um, auditing and cost accounting. Hence, um, when uh, there is a request for an uh, accounting appraisal, uh, the court appoints um, an expert witness out of the no nominees uh, registered to the recommendation list from the Japanese, Japanese Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Um, the expert witness, uh, before carrying out the appraisal, uh, investigates information relevant to the accounting of the do, um, defendant company, uh, determines items including the ledger uh, necessary to the investigation, um, and requests the, def requests the defendant company to submit them. Um, subsequently, the expert witness will receive the release of relevant documents from the defendant company and hear explanations on the substance from the uh, accounting staff. Uh, only after such an investigation uh, will the expert witness carry out calculation on his appraisal, including the assigned quantity of the relevant products and the amount of profit per unit of articles. And Oh, may I introduce the new system? Yes. Oh. Uh, 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 yeah, yes, 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 please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, passed on May 10, 2019, the revision of the Patent Act newly established an um, inspection system um, by which a third party expert can visit inspection site like a factory, um, carry out investigations regarding um, patent infringement, and submit a rep report to the court. Um, revision will come into force in next year. Uh, the introduction of this system will make it easier uh, to prove infringement uh, when infringement cannot be found uh, even after the the disassembly of the infringement, infringing product uh, when, or when the infringing products cannot be um, procured. Uh, however, uh, this system is only for proving infringement. Uh, the uh, calculation expert witness system will be used with regard to the assessment of the amount of damages. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Takahumi. Uh, next, Oliver, uh, how about in Germany? Um, in Germany, experts are generally not appointed to calculate damages. Um, in court cases, the plaintiff is asked to provide a calculation um, of damages, so he has to show all the reasoning 
why he asked for a certain amount. And uh, so the defendant can answer to this amount. So uh, it means that the plaintiff, for example, has to show how much he received and how much he has paid for um, to production. And the question if some cost that includes production can be deducted or not, we consider to be legal questions, so we have to decide it. And we do have to consider all these um, arguments and write a judgment by ourselves. So actually we are calculating on the base of our result. In order to make it easier to find a decision, um, section 287 uh, of the Civil Procedural Code gives the judge um, like um, the right to estimate damages on a certain base. So for example, judges can estimate um, the royalty rate of in license analogy, or um, we can also estimate the proportional factor of a patent in a complex product. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Um, Thierry, uh, how about in Swiss? Yes, thank you. Yes, th there is a role for experts um, in the um, damage calculation or calculation of, of compensation more generally. Um, you have to distinguish between a court-appointed um, expert and a party-appointed expert. Um, so it, it is kind of similar as in Germany that, you know, there is a presumption that it's really the burden of the plaintiff to quantify the damages. However, there have been cases where court, you know, the court has appointed experts. So the role of that expert is really to assist the court. Um, that is for reviewing the um, accounting materials furnished by defendants. Uh, maybe also in cases where I, I mentioned that before, maybe there's um, data which is partly confidential and so the um, expert can confirm that you know the data really does not need to be um, disclosed because it doesn't directly relate to the infringement. Um, so th there is actually a role for court-appointed experts, but I think it's fair to say that um, there's not too many cases. Um, if there is a court-appointed expert, it will also be typically a certified public accountant. However, I think party-appointed experts, that is, you know, there is certainly a, a role that those are frequently used. Um, also to, you know, again, to kind of review the f accounting material is furnished by the defendant as to completeness, as to plausibility, you know, is it plausible what has been um, um, furnished? In them? And on that basis then, you know, really for, for plaintiff to, to try to quantify the compensation it seeks. Damage is one aspect, the reasonable royalty rate is something I mentioned. Um, here, also like in Germany, the judge has, you know, uh, there is a legal basis for um, kind of a, an estimate to be made by the judge, but that is really not used by the judges unless you really, you, you, you file, um, you know, a basis on which they can really estimate. So that's that's very often what party appointed experts are used for. Um, they can calculate, you know, is it five percent? Is it ten percent? Ten percent royalty rate on the basis of, of you know model calculations they make on the basis of comparable. Um, they have huge databases where they would have um, you know comparable license rates. Um, so so this is what typically happens in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, um, James. Um, how about in UK? In the UK, uh, generally, uh, the parties um, will instruct experts, uh, and uh, those experts, once instructed to present evidence based upon the pleaded issues and the disclosure provided, um, under the court rules, owe, owe an overriding duty to assist the court, uh, so that they receive quite detailed instruction on their obligations to the court and have to explain in their reports that they understand those obligations. And one of the key points that's explained to experts is that uh, they, would, they should expect their evidence to be the same whichever party they had been instructed by. Uh, so uh, they're not there as a hired gun or to act as an advocate on behalf of one party or the other. And then what they have to do is to construct an explanation 
of the calculation of damages, whether that's based on putting the, def the claimant in the position they would have been in had the wrong not been committed, which is uh, uh, establishing the counterfactual of uh, 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 what would have happened had there been um, no infringement, or calculating a reasonable royalty when they're turning to comparables that the parties can provide from the marketplace, as well as the kind of databases that Thierry was talking about, um, or an account of profits where uh, the issues are the accounting data coming from uh, the defendant uh, and uh, the kind of overheads that they say they've incurred and whether they would have been incurred even if uh, the infringing activity hadn't taken place um, and, and so on. Uh, and sometimes that, uh, uh, that evidence can become uh, quite complex. So for instance, in cases where the royalty calculation is part of assessing what uh, uh, fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms are um, uh, uh, to be um, imposed by the court or uh, uh, established by the court in relation to standard essential patents, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the evidence can be quite complex and involve quite complex uh, uh, schedules of uh, data analysis that goes with them. Thank you. Um, Leonard, uh, how about in USA? In the uh, U.S. system, uh, the parties retain damages, experts. It would be extremely rare in a patent case that gets very far for the parties not to each retain their own damages expert. Those experts have access basically to all of the fact discovery, including you know the damages documents uh, that have been produced by either side. They typically write very extensive reports explaining in their view what the proper calculation is of damages and the theory, whether it's a lost profits or reasonable royalty or, or something else. They're then subject to deposition, uh, so they will be cross-examined for a day or two under oath by the other side's attorneys about uh, the basis for their opinion and the details of their expert reports. Oftentimes, there's uh, subsequent reports that are exchanged uh, after uh, that point, and then all of that is subject to uh, those Dobert motions that I've mentioned several times, uh, where the parties can ask the court to strike uh, some or all of what the expert has put as his report uh, and the basis for his damages uh, calculation. Um, we do have the ability, uh, the authority, to appoint experts ourselves. I don't believe it's done that often. I think Judge Alsup did it in the Oracle versus Google uh, case. Uh, it can be a very helpful practice, uh, but I don't think it is used all that often. Typically, we just rely on the parties uh, to present their experts and for the adversarial process to play out in the pretrial manner that I identified, and then for the jury uh, to assess uh, which expert they find uh, more persuasive. So that's how we do it. Thank you, Leonard. Um, Kisu, how about in Korea? Thank you. In practice, damages experts are not actively used in patent litigation in Korea. But there are several major cases where accounting experts were called as appraisers to assess damages. I think it would be very helpful for court to have an accounting expert as appraisers to calculate damages. Especially, the accounting experts may play an important role in cases in which accounting materials submitted by the infringers are unreliable or inadequate or not enough for judges to calculate damages. An account expert as an appraiser can conduct field investigation based on the court approval. In addition, he can ask questions to the relevant party on necessary matters to calculate damages such as sales, business situations, accounting system status, information on defendant's products, and business flow of the defendant products. And the party is required to explain necessary matters to the appraiser under Article 2 of 128. Through this process, if necessary, the court may issue an additional submission order for materials or may reflect to the damages in consideration of the defendant's sincerity to explain 
for the advisor's inquiries. Thank you. Thank you, Gisu. Um, uh, next topic is our last topic, and it's a uh, uh, IP litigation, uh, litigation for damages in European Union. And this question is uh, directed to Oliver from Germany because Germany is the main venue of IP litigation in EU. Uh, Oliver, uh, please. Thank you. Um, so we have an enforcement directive uh, of the European Union from, which was from 2004 and they set minimum standards. So um, now all the countries, as far as I understand, uh, have three calculation uh, methods, lost profit, infringers profit, or license analogy. But um, the exact way of handling um, damages is not EU-based law, but it's still based on national law. So in Germany, um, we use the normal German um, civil procedural law. So in our understanding the right holder can choose which calculation method he wants to choose until the last oral hearing, so he can also switch during the uh, trial. Um, traditionally, Germany, German judges are very restrictive when it comes to burden of proof and some reasoning, so that's why um, at least I do not know any lost profit case in Germany, because um, it's very difficult to convince um, the judges during the last 15 years um, the method infringes profit got more popular because our um, federal supreme court changed the approach so currently it's only possible to deduct um, certain costs that are directly related to the production um, which means that um, already existing costs cannot be deducted so the profit is actually higher than it is in fact and the easiest way of course is license analogy so in our cases very often parties settle after we have told parties um, which royalty rate or which proportional factor we would suggest thank you thank you oliver um, yeah we will provide uh, we will announce the case survey results is it prepared uh, please show Wow, <laughs> uh, travel damages. Oh, hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's because in in Korea, our our, our infringement damage, the amount is very small, uh, so we needed to multiply. <laughs> and uh, um, actually, we are uh, running out of time. Uh, but um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, and give, give you audience uh, the, the chance to ask the audience any questions, one or two questions, because it's very precious uh, opportunity to ask the excellent judges and lawyers. And um, please uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. And. Uh, you do not have to ask in English. We have excellent interpreters here. You can ask in Korean. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, please bring microphone to that gentleman. It's not working? Oh, oh. oh okay. Um, please uh, identify yourself oh. and, and direct your question uh, yeah. to a uh, specific speaker. 네. You know? 네, 감사합니다. 영어로 하라는 거 아니시죠? Uh, in <웃음> Korean, okay. Yeah. 네. 어, 저는 어, 한국 특허 심판원을 맡고 있는 박성준이라고 합니다. 어, 오늘 논의된 저제에 대해서 굉장히 어, 관심이 많았고 그래서 유익한 시간이었던 것 같습니다. 어, 근데 제가 질문을 드리고 싶은 것은 사실은 어, 저는 특허청에 근무를 하면서 이 징벌 배상을 도입하는 음, 과정에서 많이 관여를 했던 사람입니다. 
어, 그리고 징벌배상제도가 반영이 되고 이제 구체적으로 법원에서 어떻게 적용할지에 대해서 많은 논의가 이루어지는 것에 대해서 굉장히 기쁘게 생각을 합니다. 그런데 어, 징벌배상이 도입됐음에도 불구하고 저희는 지금 추가적인 입법을 어, 준비를 하고 있습니다. 그것은 뭐냐 하면 어, 우리 어, 한국특허법상 어, 세배 징벌 배상을 인정하기 이전에 한 배를 제대로 계산해 내는 법에 있어서 어, 많은 어, 이견이 있습니다. 방금 어, 그 김대용 음, 음, 판사님이 말씀하신 것처럼 한국의 손해 배상이 굉장히 낮은 편이라서 그런 문제가 있습니다. 근데 단적인 예로 아까 말씀하신 것 중에 손해를 계산하는 방법 중에 하나는 특허권자의 손해, 로스트 프로핏을 계산하는 방법이 있을 거고. 또 하나는 어, 침해자의 침해자의 이익을 어, 손해로 추정하는 조항이 있습니다. 어, 그런데 어, 권리자가 100개를 생산하다가 침해로 인해서 50개로 줄어들었을 때 손해를 50으로 산정하는 것은 뭐 상식적으로 이해가 됩니다. 그런데 침해자가 침해를 해서 300개를 생산해서 이익을 얻었는데 그러면 그 300개만큼의 이익을 권리자의 손해로 추정해 주는 것이 일반적인 정의의 관념이 맞다고 생각이 되는데 어, 한국의 특허법상은 손해를 산정할 때 300개를 생산한 사람의 이익을 어, 손해로 추정을 하지만 이 추정된 금액은 권리자의 당초 생산 능력을 초과할 수 없다라고 되어 있습니다. 그래서 결국 다른 사람의 특허를 침해해서 300의 이익을 얻었어도 그 사람이 물어줘야 할 손해액은 권리자의 생산 능력 100 이상을 초과할 수가 없습니다. 그러면 결국 다른 사람의 특허를 침해해서 300을 벌고 100을 물어주면 아직 200이 나왔습니다. 그렇기 때문에 이러한 그법 해석상의 어려움을 해결하기 위해서 저희는 좀더 명확하게 권리자의 이익도 손해액으로 분명하게 포함을 시켜야 한다는 걸 법문상으로 반영을 하려고 하는 입법 계획을 가지고 있습니다. 아, 지금 오늘 외국에서 오신 어, 여러 연사님들이 계신데 특히 미국, 어, 독일 어, 너무 많으셔서 시간이 될지 모르겠는데 어, 두 분만이라도 대표적으로 그 국내법에서는 어떻게 어, 적용을 하고 있는지 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 아, 저, 그러니까 그 손해 계산을 어떻게 하는지 물어보시면 어, 그렇죠. 침해자의 건가요? 이익을 네. 계산할 때 생산자의 능력으로 제한을 두는지 전부 다 보상을 해주는 지 네. 네. 미국하고 독일 말씀하셨죠? 네. 시간이 되시면 다른 분도 해주시면 감사하겠습니다. 아, 예. 아, Leonard, are you prepared? Right, thank you. So. Um, under our system, uh, the 200, I think, is what you said, uh, the, the infringing units that the defendant sold and earned profits on above and beyond the amount that the plaintiff had sold would be available potentially as lost profits, damages to the patentee. They would have to show that at the relevant time they had the capacity to make 200 additional, uh, but provided that they had the resources and the, you know, the manpower uh, to supply that full amount in the market, uh, under your scenario, I think the 200, the profits associated it, with it would be uh, retain, uh, recoverable by the patentee as lost profits damages. Yeah, uh, and uh, how about in Germany, Oliver? Not sure if I got the question right, but uh, in Germany, um, to get lost profits, you have to show um, that um, there's no other reason that uh, um, uh, distribution dropped. So if there's a market where you have more than mm -hmm. one other, uh, if you have another competitor, mm -hmm. most probably you cannot get lost profits because um, it is um, you cannot prove that. Mm -hmm. It's just the infringement that influenced yes, um, yeah, uh -huh. the drop in sales. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much. May I just? Yeah, 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 James. Of, um, of course. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in the UK, we have a um, quite a pragmatic solution to that problem, which is that if a, a claimant can show that 50 um, uh, amounted to lost sales, then it will get the lost profit on those, and 
any associated um, lost profit with convoyed goods and so on. And in relation to the other 200, then you're entitled to a reasonable royalty because your property in the intellectual property has been infringed in that way so that you don't go uncompensated, it's just compensated on a different scale. Thank you. Um, this concludes session four. Uh, let me first thank our distinguished speakers uh, for sharing with us uh, their opinions on the various questions. Also, I'd like to thank you, uh, our audience, uh, for listening carefully. Uh, thank you very much. Although the situation varies from country to country, I think every country is trying to make the best system in its own way. I think uh, today's panel discussion will be very helpful in understanding the differences between countries and in developing their institutions. Uh, thank you very much all. I think that was a pretty amazing session and I'm glad to see Stark still alive. <laughs> <laughs> this session and the poll. Session four, it's time for lunch. Lunch will be served at your table. Uh, the bus to the patent court will be waiting for you at the hotel entrance by 1.30. Please get on the bus after lunch. Please enjoy your meal. Ah, one more thing. Uh, IP Bench ORG is open now. This site is for IP judges. You can access and the, the website and sign up. We will upload the photo from the conference. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>